<clears throat> okay, this is uh, Joseph Smith, the early years. In the small farming community of Sharon, Vermont, on December 23rd of 1805, Lucy Smith gave birth to her fifth child, Joseph Smith Jr. While the proud parents doubtlessly had high hopes for the son who bore his father's name, they could hardly have imagined that one day he would produce new books of scripture and start a church that would eventually grow to over 13 million members. In the following, I will outline three areas of influence that helped to shape Joseph Smith's religious career. The first one is Smith's religious environment. The second, the family's involvement with folk magic. And the third is the public interest in the American Indians of the day. First one, Joseph Smith's religious environment. Many people in the New England area during the late 1700s and early 1800s were turning away from organized religion believing that most denominations had fallen into apostate practices. It was a time in America of religious upheaval, revivals, and new sects. <clears throat> Many Christians were looking for a restoration of the New Testament church. Von Brody described the religious turmoil of the day, quote, the Methodists split four ways between 1814 and 1830. The Baptists split into Reformed Baptists, Hardshell Baptists, Free Will Baptists, Seventh Day Baptists, Foot Washers, and other sects. Unfettered religious liberty began spawning a host of new religions. Many in that day were drawn to the Seeker movement and its rejection of organized churches. Historian Dan Vogel comments The primitive gospel movement emerged first among the common folk of New England, the South, West, and West between the years 1790 and 1830. Those term seekers were waiting for a new dispensation of apostolic authority. Vogel further observed, one independent seeker, as a wild, of Amsterdam, New York, published in 1824 a short work describing his revolt against Puritanism and his conversion to seekerism. His work, a short sketch of the religious experience of spiritual travels of as a wild, outlines the classic seeker position and demonstrates his yearning for a restoration and the millennium. <clears throat> While both Joseph Smith's parents professed Christianity, they came from families that were divided over religion. Lucy Smith, that's Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Smith's parents were not united in their faith. Lucy's mother was a staunch Congregationalist, while her father, Solomon Mack, advocated universalism which maintained that God would save all mankind. Then in 1811, Solomon claimed to have a religious conversion and wrote a small book detailing his new faith and return to orthodoxy. Later, the Book of Mormon re would reflect elements of the universalist debate. In the Book of Alma, we read of a certain man named Nehor whose preaching echoed that of the universalists. He went about preaching that, quote, all mankind should be saved at the last day and that they need not fear or tremble, but that they might lift up their heads and rejoice, for the Lord had created all men and had redeemed all men, and in the end all men should be saved and have eternal life. <clears throat> that was a quote from the Book of Mormon. After killing a man of God who tried to call him to repentance, Nehor was sentenced to death. Just before he died, he repented of his false teachings. Those familiar with the revival literature of Joseph Smith's day recognize similar teachings in the Book of Mormon. Von Brody observed, in the speeches of the Nephite prophets, one may find the religious conflicts that were splitting the churches in the 1820s. Alexander Campbell, founder of the Disciples of Christ, wrote in the first able review of the Book of Mormon, this is quoting Alexander Campbell, this prophet Smith, through his stone spectacles, wrote on the plates of Nephi in his Book of Mormon every error and almost every truth discussed in New York for the last 10 years. He decided all the great controversies, infant baptism, ordination, the Trinity, regeneration, repentance, justification, the fall of man, the atonement, transubstantiation, fasting, penance, church government, religious experience, the call to the ministry, the general resurrection, eternal punishment, who may baptize, and even the question of Freemasonry, Republican government, and the rights of men. 
but he is better skilled in the controversies in New York than in the geography or history of Judea. He makes John baptized in the village of Bethabara and says Jesus was born in Jer Jerusalem. That's the end of the Campbell quote. Curiously, while the Book of Mormon addresses many of the doctrinal disputes of Smith's day, it does not contain the major doctrines of Mormonism that separate it from standard Christianity. While the Book of Mormon condemns universalism, by 1832, Smith seems to have changed his mind. Section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants teaches three levels of heaven with a place for practically everyone. The Book of Mormon contains no teaching on the need for temple rituals, eternal marriage, plural gods, man's pre-mortal existence, proxy work for the dead, three levels of heaven, or eternal progression. In fact, the Book of Mormon declares that death seals one's fate and that there is no opportunity to repent after one dies. See Alma 34, verses 31 through 35. One can easily see the similarities between doctrines in the Book of Mormon and the revival rhetoric of the 1820s. Joseph Smith's uncle Jason, Lucy's oldest brother, became a seeker and set up a quasi-communistic society of 30 indigent families whose economic and spiritual welfare he sought to direct. In this environment of competing philosophies, Lucy, Joseph's mother, felt undecided about church membership. She later wrote about this period of her life, quote, if I remain a member of no church, all religious people will say I am of the world, and if I join some one of the different denominations, all the rest will say I am in error. No church will admit that I am right, except the one with which I associate. This makes them witness against each other, and how can I decide in such a case as this, seeing they are all unlike the Church of Christ as it existed in former days. Joseph Smith's father came from a similar background. Dan Vogel explains, in 1796, Lucy married a man similarly perplexed about religion, although his primitivism stemmed from independence more than uncertainty. Joseph Smith Sr. was more liberal, apparently agreeing with Lucy's father about universal salvation. Joseph Smith Sr. had been raised by a father whose curious blend of theological views was legendary in his community of Topsfield, Massachusetts. Joseph's father, Aziel, this is Joseph Smith Sr.'s father, Aziel, was a rationalist whose beliefs included universalism and seekerism. He refused to join any of the churches because he could not reconcile their teachings with the scriptures and his reason. But by, 18, by the 1820s, Lucy Smith was longing for some sort of religious affiliation. A family disaster would complicate this search. In 1823, the Smith's oldest son, Alvin, died from a bowel obstruction, and at the funeral, the minister inferred that Alvin had gone to hell as he was not a baptized member of a church. This cemented Joseph Smith Sr. in his rejection of organized religion. When Lucy Smith attended the 1824-25 Palmyra revival, Joseph Smith Sr. refused to accompany her. As a result of these meetings, Lucy Smith, her sons Hiram and Samuel, and a daughter joined the Presbyterian Church. This division in the home obviously impacted Joseph Smith Jr. LDS historian Richard Bushman observed, if there was a personal motive for Joseph Smith Jr.'s revelations, it was to satisfy his family's religious want and above all to meet the need of his oft-defeated, unmoored father. During these years, young Joseph Smith had been attending various religious meetings, revivals, and even joined the local Young People's Debating Club. At times, he participated in revival meetings as an exhorter one who would speak after the regular sermon and exhort the audience to follow the admonitions of the preacher. When writing about these events many years later, Joseph Smith explained, during this time of great excitement, my mind was called up to serious reflection and great uneasiness. But though my feelings were deep and often poignant, still I kept myself aloof from all these parties, though I attended their several meetings as often as occasion would permit. In process of time, my mind became somewhat partial to the Methodist sect, and I felt some desire to unite with them. But so great were the confusion and strife among the different denominations that it was impossible for a person young as I was and so unacquainted with men and things to come to any certain conclusion of who was right and who was wrong. 
the Presbyterians were most decidedly against the Baptists and the Methodists. Retired LDS Institute Director Grant Palmer has pointed out the similarity between the Methodist camp meetings with, which Smith would have attended and those in the Book of Mormon. Quote, we have not taken Joseph Smith seriously enough when he stated that he had an intimate acquaintance with evangelical religion and that he was somewhat partial to the Methodists. Protestant concepts appear to abound in his discourses and experiences. For example, a Methodist camp meeting was held one mile from Palmyra, New York, on 7th of June, 1826, a pivotal time in Joseph Smith's life. Preparations for a camp meeting included leasing and consecrating the ground. Thus, the ground within the circle of the tents is considered sacred to the worship of God and is our chapel. The Methodists referred to these consecrated grounds as their house of God or temple. The Palmyra camp meeting reportedly attracted over 10,000 people. Families came from all parts of the 100-mile conference district and pitched their tents facing the raised stand where the preachers were seated. This large crowd heard the valedictory or farewell speech of their beloved Bishop McKendry, who made his appearance among us for the last time. In his emaciated and feeble condition, he spoke of his love for the people and then delivered a powerful message that covered the whole process of personal salvation. Tremendous unity prevailed among the crowd and nearly every unconverted person on the ground committed oneself to Christ. This is reminiscent of King Benjamin and his speech to the Zarahemlans in the Book of Mormon, whose chronicler describes the setting. And this is a quote from the Book of Mormon. The people gathered themselves together throughout all the land that they might go up to the temple and hear the last words of their beloved King Benjamin, who should speak to them. They pitched their tents round about every man according to his family, every man having his tent with the door therefore towards the temple, the multitude being so great that King Benjamin caused a tower to be erected. And he said to them, I am about to go down to my grave. I am no longer to be your teacher, for even at this time my whole frame doth tremble exceedingly while attempting to speak unto you. That's Mosiah 2, uh, various verses through that chapter. Again, you see how closely the Book of Mormon revival meeting sounds like ones Joseph would have experienced. Palmer also observed, quote, evangelical meetings in western New York in the 1820s were characterized by one, camp meetings, two, preaching the interlaced, paraphrased biblical passages with revival terminology designed to produce a powerful emotional impact, three, a conversion pattern characterized by a conviction of sin, intense prayer for forgiveness, and a sweet calming assurance of being forgiven, often accompanied by trembling, tears, falling, and other phys <coughs> physical manifestations, four, denunciation of deists, Unitarians, Universalists, and Agnostics, and five vivid descriptions of the degenerate state of human beings. While all five of these elements formed a pattern that was typical in Joseph Smith's environment, one would not expect to find them packaged together in the discourses and experiences of ancient Americans. It is more believable that the Protestant Reformation, including its evolving doctrines and practices down to Joseph Smith's era, influenced these sections of the Book of Mormon. The LDS Church has traditionally emphasized Joseph Smith's lack of education to establish that the Book of Mormon was beyond his writing ability. However, Grant Palmer observed, quote, thus we have an image of Joseph Smith as one not learned. While this accurately describes his formal education, it misstates his knowledge of the Bible, of evangelical Protestantism, and of American antiquities within his environment. He wrote in his 1832 history that his parents were thorough in instructing me in the Christian religion, and that from age 12 on, he became a serious Bible student by searching the scriptures. The extensive plagiarisms of phrases from the King James Bible in the Book of Mormon demonstrates Joseph Smith's familiarity with the text. Joseph Smith later claimed that it was because of a revival in the neighborhood that he went out into the woods to pray and received his first vision. He placed the date in 1820 However, the description of the revival given by various family members places the date in the 1824 time frame after part of the family had joined the Presbyterian Church. 
But even his claim of a vision was not an unusual occurrence during the many revivals in New York. Joseph Smith's 1838 account of his first vision, published in the Pearl of Great Price, tells how in 1820 he went into a grove to pray and to know which church to join. At first, a dark power overtook him, then crying out to God, he observed a great light. Two beings appeared to him and told him not to join any of the churches as they were, quote, all wrong and that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight. He concluded, when I came to myself again, I found myself lying on my back looking up into heaven. When the light had departed, I had strength, but soon recovering in some degree, I went home. These two beings are identified today as God the Father and Jesus Christ. Richard Bushman recounted the visions of Nora Stearns, whose 1815 story sounds very similar to Joseph Smith's account. This is quoting. One was God my maker, almost in bodily shape like a man. His face was as it were a flame of fire, and his body as it had been a pillar and a cloud. Below him stood Jesus Christ, my Redeemer, in perfect shape, like a man. Again, in 1816, a minister by the name of Elias Smith published a book in which he told of his conversion. Notice the similarity to Joseph Smith's first account. I went into the woods. A light appeared from heaven. My mind seemed to rise in the light to the throne of God and the Lamb. The Lamb once slain appeared to my understanding, and while viewing him, I felt such love to him as I never felt as anything earthly. It is not possible for me to tell how long I remained in that situation. Alexander Campbell wrote the following on March 1st of 1824 concerning a revival in New York. Quote, enthusiasm flourishes. This man was regenerated when asleep by a vision of the night. That man heard a voice in the woods saying, thy sins be forgiven thee. A third saw his savior descending to the tops of the trees at noonday. As a wild claimed to have a vision which is very similar, similar to the story Joseph Smith later published. It was printed in the Wayne Sentinel, the paper to which the Smith family apparently subscribed. And this was published on October 22nd, 1823. It seemed as if my mind was struck motionless as well as into nothing before the awful and glorious majesty of the great Jehovah. He then spake. He also told me that every denomination of professing Christians had become extremely corrupt, end quote. See, uh, Joseph Smith's claims were not unusual for its day. With so many people dissatisfied with the churches of the day and looking for some sort of restoration, it is easy to see why some people would be attracted to Joseph Smith's claims and the Book of Mormon, which echoed many of the same criticisms. Now we move to the Smith family's involvement with magic. In the 1820s, many people believed in magical stones that allowed the owner to discern location of lost treasures. For instance, on February 16, 1825, the Wayne Sentinel, published in Joseph's Neighborhood, reprinted the following from the Windsor, Vermont Journal. This was quoting from the article. Money digging. We are sorry to observe, even this, in this enlightened age, so prevalent a disposition to credit the accounts of the marvelous. Even the frightful stories of money being hid under the surface of the earth and enchanted by the devil or Robert Kidd are received by many of our respectable fellow citizens as truths. A respectable gentleman in Tunbridge was informed by means of a dream that a chest of money was buried in a small island. After having been directed by the mineral rod where to search for the money, he and his laborers came upon a chest of gold. The chest moved off through the mud and has not been seen or heard of since. Another similar story was printed in December 27, 1825 in the Wayne Sentinel. Quote, wonderful discovery. A few days since was discovered in this town by the help of a mineral stone, which becomes transparent when placed in a hat, and the light excluded by the face of him who looks into it, provided he is fortune's favorite, a monstrous potash kettle in the bowels of old mother earth filled with the purest bullion. His satanic majesty, or some other invisible agent, appears to keep it under marching orders. For no sooner is it dug on into the one place than it moves off like false delusive hope to another still more remote. In 1822, Joseph Smith found a magic stone like the one mentioned in the newspaper while digging a well for his neighbor Willard Chase. In 1833, Mr. Chase gave this account of the event. 
In the year 1822, I was engaged in digging a well. I employed Alvin and Joseph Smith to assist me, the latter of whom is now known as the Mormon prophet. After digging about 20 feet below the surface of the earth, we discovered a singular appearing stone, which excited my curiosity. I brought it to the top of the well, and as we examined it, Joseph put it in his hat and then his face into the top of the hat. After obtaining the stone, he began to publish abroad what wonders he could discover by looking into it. A few years later, Joseph Smith would use this same stone to translate the gold plates of the Book of Mormon. David Whitmer, one of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon, described the process. I will now give you a description of the manner in which the Book of Mormon was translated. Joseph would put the seer stone in a hat and put his face in the hat, drawing it closely around his face to exclude the light. And in the darkness, the spiritual light would shine. A piece of something resembling parchment would appear, and on that appeared the writing. This is foreshadowed in the Book of Mormon. Now Ammon said, I can assuredly tell thee, O king, of a man that can translate the records, for he has wherewith he can look and translate all records that are of ancient date. And it is a gift from God, and the things are called interpreters. And no man can look in them except he be commanded, lest he should look for that he ought not, and he should perish. Whosoever is commanded to look on them, the same is called seer. This is from Mosiah 8.13. In 1834, E.D. Howe published his expose titled Mormonism Unveiled, and in it he printed a number of statements by neighbors of the Smiths recounting their involvement with magic and money digging. Willard Stafford wrote, I first became acquainted with Joseph Smith Sr. and his family in the year 1820. They lived at a time in Palmyra, about one mile and a half from my residence. A great part of their time was devoted to money digging for, mo digging for money. I had heard them tell marvelous tales respecting the discoveries they had made in their peculiar occupation of money digging. They would say, for instance, that in such a place, in such a hill, on a certain man's farm, there were deposited kegs, barrels, and hogheads of coined silver and gold, bars of gold, golden images, brass kettles filled with gold and silver, golden candlesticks, swords, etc. In 1825, after hearing of Joseph Smith's powers, a man named Josiah Stoll came to Palmyra to hire the Smiths to help him look for a silver mine in Pennsylvania. At that time, Joseph and his father entered into an agreement with those searching for the treasure to share anything found in the dig. Smith's stone was to be their key to finding the silver. Smith's mother relates that Mr. Stoll specifically sought out Joseph Smith due to his special powers. Lucy Smith wrote, Quote, a short time before the house was completed, this would be 1825, a man by the name of Josiah Stoll came from Shenango County, New York, with the view of getting Joseph to assist him in digging for a sil silver mine. He came for Joseph on account of having heard that he possessed a certain means by which he could discern things invisible to the natural eye, end of quote. And this, of course, is in reference to his stone. However, a relative of Mr. Stoll became worried that Joseph Smith was defrauding his uncle and filed charges against him in 1826. Michael Marquardt and Wes Walters commented, quote, while Joseph Smith was working for Josiah Stoll, he was brought before a court on charges sworn against him by a nephew of Josiah Stoll, Peter Bridgman. Apparently, Bridgman became concerned that his uncle's money was being spent in the pursuit of elusive treasure. Accounts of these charges corroborate Smith's treasure hunting in southern New York and Pennsylvania. Joseph Smith was arrested and brought before Judge Albert Neely on March 20th of 1826. Judge Neely's record refers to Smith as, quote, the glass looker. At the hearing, Josiah Stoll testified in Smith's behalf and said that the prisoner had been at his home something like five months, had been employed by him to work on farm part-time, that he, Joseph, pretended to have skill of telling where hidden treasures in the earth were by means of looking through a certain stone. That prisoner had looked for him sometimes, once to tell him about money buried in Ben Mountain in Pennsylvania, once for gold on Monument Hill, and once for a salt spring. And that he positively knew that the prisoner could tell and did possess the art of seeing those valuable treasures through the medium of said stone. There is a difference of opinion among historians if this was actually the trial or the preliminary hearing. Regardless, it demonstrates Smith's involvement in treasure hunting by means of his stone.
Joseph Smith would have been 20 at the, years old at the time and was evidently allowed to leave the county. When he later claimed to have found the gold plates containing the Book of Mormon, the money diggers came seeking their share of the treasure. Book of Mormon witness Martin Harris wrote, the money diggers claimed that they had as much right to the plates as Joseph had as they were in company together. They claimed that Joseph had been a traitor and had appropriated to himself that which belonged to them. For this reason, Joseph was afraid and continued concealing the plates. While Joseph Smith was in the employ of Mr. Stoll, he met his future bride, Emma. Emma Hale's uh, father was boarding the Smiths. However, her father would not give his consent to their marriage due to Smith's magic pursuits and money digging. Soon after this, in 1827, Joseph and Emma eloped and moved to Palmyra. Later, Joseph told Mr. Hale, his father-in-law, that, quote, he had given up what he called last looking and that he expected to work hard for a living. The Smiths then moved back to the Hale farm. Evidently, the stillbirth of the Smiths' first child in June of 1828 caused Joseph to seriously reconsider his religious views, and he sought membership in the Methodist Church. When Joseph Lewis, Emma's cousin, learned of this fact, he felt that it was a disgrace to the church to have a, quote, practicing necromancer, a dealer in enchantments and bleeding ghosts in it. Mr. Lewis told him either to publicly ask to have his name stricken from the class book or stand a disciplinary investigation. Mr. Lewis stated that Joseph Smith immediately re requested his name to be taken off the class book. This is from the Amboy Journal, June 11, 1879, page one. Earlier, I quoted an account from the Smith's local newspaper about cursed treasures that slip into the ground when someone tries to unearth them. The same type of phenomena is echoed in the Book of Mormon. In the 13th chapter of Helaman, we read, and behold, the time cometh that he curses your riches, in that they become slippery, that you cannot hold them, and in the days of your poverty ye you you cannot obtain them, and then shall you lament, saying, Oh, that we had remembered the Lord our God in the day that he gave us our riches, and then they would not have become slippery, that we should lose them, for behold, our riches are gone from us. Behold, we lay a tool here, and on the morrow it's gone. And behold, our swords are taken from us in the day we have sought them for battle. Yea, we have hidden our treasures, and they have slipped away from us because of the curse of the land. Oh, that we had repented, and the day of the word of the Lord came to us. For behold, the land is cursed, and all things are become slippery, and we cannot hold them. That's the end of the quote. <clears throat> Thus we see how Smith's view of treasures hidden in the ground carried over into his book of scripture. Years later, when Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy, wrote her memoirs, she explained that the family always balanced their time between working, magical pursuits, and their faith. This is a quote from her writing. I shall change my theme for the present, but let not the reader suppose that, I, that because I shall pursue another topic for a season, that we stopped our labor and went at trying to win the faculty of Abrac. Now, Fabric, I don't know if you as kids heard about abracadabra. That's a real magical thing. And it's a, a triangle uh, where you write abracadabra and then it goes across and down the side. So she says, they went about trying to win the faculty of Abrac, drawing magic circles or soothsaying to the neglect of all kinds of business. We never during our lives suffered one important interest to swallow up every other obligation, but whilst we worked with our hands, we endeavored to remember the service and welfare of our souls. So you have Mother Smith even admitting the family's deep involvement in the occult. Besides the use of seer stones, the Smiths used divining rods, sticks that were usually forked to both look for water and to locate treasure. A friend of the family recounted a conversation with Joseph Smith Sr. in which Smith explained that he had spent some time and money searching for buried treasures using a divining rod. Joseph Smith's principal scribe, Oliver Cowdery, was also involved in folk magic. One important change Joseph Smith made in his revelations was an obvious attempt to cover up the endorsement of Oliver Cowdery's supposed gift from God for working with a divining rod. In the 1833 printing of Smith's Revelations, titled Book of Commandments, was a revelation given to Oliver Cowdery in 1829. In this was stated, Now this is not all, for you have another gift, which is the gift of working with the rod. 
Behold, it has told you things. Behold, there is no other power save God that can cause this rod of nature to work in your hands. However, in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, this revelation was edited. Now it says, Now this is not all thy gift, for you have another gift, which is the gift of Aaron. Behold, it has told you many things. Behold, there is no other gift save the power of God that can cause this gift of Aaron to be with you. Notice that the words working with the rod and rod of nature have been changed to the more respectable sounding gift of Aaron. <coughs> Those who used divining rods were sometimes called rodsmen. Richard P. Howard, RLDS church historian, observed, quote, several writers have established that both in Vermont and in western New York in the early 1800s, one of the many forms which enthusiastic religion took was the adaptation of the witch hazel stick. For example, the divining rod was often used by one Nathaniel Wood in Rutledge County, Vermont in 1801. Wood, Winchell, William Cowdery Jr., and his son Oliver Cowdery all had some knowledge of and associations with the various uses, both secular and sacred, of the forked witch hazel rod. Winchell and others used such a rod in seeking buried treasure. <clears throat> when Joseph Smith met Oliver Cowdery in April of 1829, he found a man peculiarly adept in the use of the forked rod, and against the background of his own experiments with and uses of oracle media, Joseph Smith's April 1829 affirmation about Cowdery's unnatural powers related to working with the rod are quite understandable." End of quote. <clears throat> Mormon historians now concede the reality of the Smith's family involvement with magic. D. Michael Quinn, in his book, Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview, observes, quote, friendly sources corroborate hostile non-Mormon accounts. As historian Richard L. Bushman has written, and this is a quote from Mormon historian Bushman, there had always been evidence of it, money digging in the Smith family, in the hostile affidavits from the Smith's neighbors evidence which Mormons dismissed as hopelessly biased. But when I got into the sources, I found evidence from friendly contemporaries as well, Martin Harris, Joseph Knight, Oliver Cowdery, and Lucy Mack Smith. All of these witnesses persuaded me treasure-seeking and vernacular magic were part of the Smith family tradition, and that the hostile witnesses, including the 1826 trial record, had to be taken seriously. BYU historian Marvin S. Hill has likewise observed, now most historians, Mormon or not, who work with the sources, accept as fact Joseph Smith's career as village magician. <coughs> Third area, contemporary attitudes about the American Indian. In the early 1800s, there, were high, uh, there was high interest in the American Indian culture and artifacts, resulting in many books and newspaper articles. The local newspapers occasionally ran stories about the Indians. The Palmyra Register for May 26, 1819 reported that one writer, quote, believes and we think with good reason that this country was once inhabited by a race of people at least partially civilized and that this race has been exterminated by the forefathers of the present and late tribes of Indians in this country. Furthermore, the following was published in the Smith's local paper, The Wayne Sentinel, in 1825. Those who are most conversant with the public and private economy of the Indians are strongly of opinion that they are the lineal descendants of the Israelites, and my own researches go far to confirm me in the same belief. Dan Vogel gave the following overview of Smith's environment. By 1830, knowledge of the impressive ruined cities of the Mayan of Central America and the Inca of South America were commonplace in northeastern United States. In addition, the inhabitants of those states were almost daily reminded of the building acumen of the early Indians. The remnants of fortifications as well as burial mounds dotted the area. Since most 19th century Americans did not make a distinction among the various cultures and lifestyles of the Native Americans, and instead thought of these desperate groups as belonging to one race, the Indian, they also tended to see all of these ruins as coming from one group. What must this group have been like to have engineered such structures? The Book of Mormon tells the story of such a people and provides possible answers to persistent questions about their history. There were a number of books printed in Joseph Smith's day to provide 
such answers. It was a common theory of the day that the American Indians descended from Israel, the very idea put forward in the Book of Mormon. In 1652, Manasseh ben Israel's book, Hope of Israel, was published in England. This Jewish rabbi was a firm believer that remnants of the ten tribes of Israel had been discovered in the Americas. In 1775, James Adair published The History of the American Indian. He theorized that there were 23 parallels between Indian and Jewish customs. For example, he claimed the Indian spoke a corrupt form of Hebrew, honored the Jewish Sabbath, performed circumcision, and offered animal sacrifice. He discussed various theories explaining Indian origins, problems of transocean crossing, and the theory that the mound builders were a white group more advanced than the other Indians. A popular book in Smith's day was View of the Hebrews by Reverend Ethan Smith, printed in 1823, with a second edition in 1825, therefore showing how popular it was. LDS General Authority B.H. Roberts wrote extensively about the parallels between View of the Hebrews and the Book of Mormon. Reverend Robert Hollinger gave the following summary of Mormon B.H. Roberts' parallel list. Quote, according to Roberts' later studies, some features of view of the Hebrews are paralleled in the Book of Mormon. And then he gives a list of these. One, Indians buried a book they could no longer read. Number two, a Mr. Merrick found some dark yellow parchment leaves in Indian Hill. Three, Native Americans had inspired prophets and charismatic gifts, as well as four, their own kind of Urim and Thummim and breastplate. Five, Ethan Smith produced evidence to show that a Ancient Mexican Indians were no strangers to Egyptian hieroglyphs. Six, an overthrown civilization in America is to be seen from its ruined monuments and forts and mounds. The barbarous tribes, barbarous because they had lost the civilized arts, greeting the Europeans were descended of the lost civilization. Seven, chapter one of View of the Hebrews is a 32-page account of the historical destruction of Jerusalem. Eight, there were many references to Israel scattering and being gathered in the last days. Nine, Isaiah is quoted for 20 chapters to demonstrate the restoration of Israel. In Isaiah 18, a request is made to save Israel in America. Similarity 10, the United States is asked to civilize the Native Americans. 11, Ethan Smith cites Humboldt's New Spain to show the characteristics of Central American civilization, the same as are in the Book of Mormon. 12, the legends of Quetzalcoatl, the Mexican Messiah, are paralleled in the Book of Mormon by Christ appearing in the Western Hemisphere. Roberts came to realize that at least in the case of Ethan Smith's book, such works were widely available. Dr. Simon Southerton observed, in spite of its extensive similarities with the Book of Mormon, view of the Hebrews should not be regarded as the sole source of inspiration for the book. The basic themes running through both publications merely reflect the most commonly accepted myths surrounding the mounds, the Indians, and the original colonization of America. The principal difference is that Ethan Smith's work was open speculation, whereas the Book of Mormon was a narrative that purported to be a literal eyewitness account of what happened. The white man's perceptions of Native Americans and the mound builder myth, both of which permeated New England society of Joseph Smith's day, became embedded in Mormon scripture. In many respects, the characteristics of the Book of Mormon Lamanites mirror the misunderstanding that surfaced in the froth of frontier speculation. The mound builder myth receives scriptural confirmation in the closing chapters of the Book of Mormon story, where the final destruction of the fair-skinned civilization Nephites occurs at the hand of their brethren, the savage, dark-skinned Lamanites. The story must have appeared plausible to early Americans who, for the most part of the 19th century, believed that Native Americans were responsible for the genocide of the postulated earlier, uh, the earlier advanced race. The stereotypes and misunderstandings served to validate the Europeans' theft of Native lands as an act of retribution. American Indians were themselves intruders in a land that belonged to an, an earlier race, one that was conformingly similar to the white colonists. And that's the end of the quote from Dr. Southerton. That Joseph Smith was intrigued with the stories of the earliest inhabitants of the New World can be seen in Mother Smith's memoirs. She noted Joseph's storytelling ability and interest in the Indians, quote, During our evening conversations, Joseph would occasionally give us some of the most amusing recitals that could be imagined. 
He would describe the ancient inhabitants of this continent, their dress, mode of travel, and the animals upon which they rode, their cities, their buildings, with every particular, their mode of welfare, warfare, and also their religious worship. This he would do as, with as much ease, seemingly, as if he had spent his whole life among them. Uh, by the way, I think that demonstrates his practicing his Book of Mormon story for years before he dictates it to Oliver Cowdery. It should be borne in mind that the Book of Mormon parallels the views of Smith's day. It does not parallel archaeology today. This is one of the areas which demonstrate that the Book of Mormon was written in the 1820s, not 600 BC to 421 AD. Conclusion. Thus we see the disputes over religion preceding Joseph Smith's founding of a church supplied the ideas for his new religion. The Book of Mormon contains many of the same doctrinal debates that were raging in Joseph Smith's area. His first vision mirrors many of those of his day. His new church supplied the necessary means to unite his family on both doctrine and church. His family was also immersed in the magical worldview of the day, practicing water witching, stone gazing, and appealing to the faculty of Abrak. The same phenomena of slipping treasures appears in the Book of Mormon as it did in Smith's environment. Smith's youth of a object to discern the will of God is also reflected in the Book of Mormon. The regional discussion and curiosity about the origin of the American Indians and their possible descent from Israelites provided a framework for Smith's new book of scripture. From this, we conclude that Joseph Smith's environment provided the components necessary to author the Book of Mormon and start his new church. Just as the Methodist leaders pleaded with Joseph Smith to renounce his unbiblical beliefs and practices, we plead with our LDS friends to come back to biblical Christianity. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Thank you. <laughs>